move past the logos and look at the actual teams and it becomes so much more interesting to see them going at it again four years later. Welcome into the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon. Welcome to Super Bowl week. I am Dave Hellman. We have got you covered from now all the way up to Sunday. We're going to break down every aspect of the final game of the NFL season. It's the Kansas City Chiefs taking on the San Francisco 49ers out in Las Vegas. It's going to be a hell of a week. Not only are we going to preview the game, we're going to bring the season to a close you want to be here for the whole thing, please go find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you like to get your podcasts. We have a YouTube channel. Maybe you've heard me mention it. I would love it if you could subscribe to that if you prefer the visual element of this whole thing. Either way, we got you covered. We're going to have some extra fun this week in addition to just the game. Like I said, we got NFL honors coming up, the end of season awards finally getting announced. We're going to do our own. We would love a little bit of viewer, listener participation. If you want to go find us on Twitter or Instagram, we're going to put up our end of season polls about who should win what, your MVP race, your, your rookies of the year, all of that good stuff. We're going to do our own show in addition to recapping the award winners. Go find the polls. Help us decide how to wrap up this season. It's going to be a lot of fun. But here on a Monday, still the game still feels so far away. We're going to start really broad and bring this thing in to a focal point as we get closer. So on a Monday, I just want to look at the five most interesting storylines surrounding what I think is a really great game. And we talked about it last week. I think the general consensus is this is the matchup fans didn't want to see for a variety of reasons. The Chiefs are too successful. The Niners have won too many games. The Niners are, are so widely talked about despite having never won a Super Bowl. I'm sure the Taylor Swift element of it is another reason people didn't want to see it. But if you can get past all of that, and I hope you do, this is such an interesting matchup for a lot of different reasons. So we're going to do the top five. And I'm going to start it out right here with the first one, which is just the rematch element of this. And maybe you're fatigued about that too. These teams played in Super Bowl 54 just four short years ago in Miami. But the interesting thing about that is so much has changed. So I'm if, if that's how you feel, I'm asking you to put that aside because so much is different for the 49ers and for the Chiefs as they head into this Super Bowl rematch. For starters, do you realize how dissimilar these rosters really are? Yeah, a lot of the star power is the same, and that's worth mentioning. But there are just 19 players on these two teams combined that took part in Super Bowl 54. 106 guys are going to be available to play on Sunday, just 19 of them played in this game last time. And then when you weed out the role players, the backups, and guys who might not even get into the action, you really wind up with about 12 that played a meaningful role in Super Bowl 54. To be fair, you're going to recognize a lot of those names. It's funny, for the Chiefs, so much has changed since they won that championship. All that's really left in terms of guys that are going to make a difference are their, their core. Patrick Mahomes, obviously. Travis Kelsey, obviously. Chris Jones. Then after that, you basically got Harrison Butker, and that's it. Everything else has turned over remarkably from a roster standpoint. Even, look, Andy Reid is obviously the centerpiece of this whole thing going back all the way to 2013. Steve Spagnuolo is there, but even, you know, Eric Bieniemy no longer part of this. There's even been some coaching turnover. Remarkable. How few guys, like we, we think of the Chiefs of a di as a dynasty, or at least I do, and it's crazy how much has really changed to this point. 49ers, it's a little bit longer of a list and a lot of, lot of star power here. I think it helps that their rookie class in 2019 was so impactful because Nick Bosa's still here, Dre Greenlaw's still here, 
Debo Samuel's still here. And then some older veterans as well, whether it's Fred Warner, whether it's Kyle Juszczyk, one of the first free agent signings of the Shanahan era, Eric Armstead as well. But after that, which admittedly, it's a fairly long list, but the rest of this roster has completely turned over. I mentioned this last week. Think of the major role players on this Niners team that weren't here. Brock Purdy is the obvious headliner, but they drafted Brandon Ayuk in the first round in 2020. I didn't realize this. It feels like I know he started his career in Washington. It feels like Trent Williams has been a Niner for a decade, and he was not on hand for this last game in Super Bowl 54. I was pretty shook when I realized that. And that's without even mentioning the guy that makes this whole thing go, in my opinion anyway, Christian McCaffrey. Maybe you've heard of him. Remember how audacious it felt two Octobers ago when the 49ers dealt for Christian McCaffrey, a running back, an expensive running back at that? How well has that paid off? All pro, the most valuable player on this team, in my opinion. And a guy who, look, I mean, they're a, they're a Brock Purdy injury in the NFC Championship game last year from potentially playing in back-to-back games. What a phenomenal trade. So many star players that weren't here last time. Javon Hargrave, the big offseason addition, our friend of the show, guy who came on and talked to us in October. This is why he went to San Francisco. Safe to say it worked out for him. A favorite of mine, you see it right there on the lower third if you're watching, One of the guys in this game, Charvarius Ward, has flopped teams. He was a a good starter at cornerback for the Kansas City Chiefs when they won that championship. He has developed into an all-pro for the 49ers, the best piece of that San Francisco secondary. So that's a fun little element. I'm sure Charvarius Ward will have some things to say to some of his old teammates, some of his old coaches. 49ers coaching staff, of course, Kyle Shanahan takes the headlines, and deservedly so, but think about how much turnover has happened there. Mike McDaniel's long gone. Forget D'Amico Ryans. It was Robert Sala last time the Niners were in this game. So Kyle Shanahan's coaching tree is is off taking over the rest of the NFL. We'll see if Steve Wilkes and, and this new look San Francisco coaching staff can do what the previous one didn't. Because it's it's truly a lot of new faces flipping back over to Kansas City. They have reinvented themselves so amazingly. I mean, it's well documented what they've done at wide receiver. Rasheed Rice leads the way there. But particularly the offensive line, I think it's such an important part of what helps Patrick Mahomes be successful. They've brought in Joe Tooney since that last Super Bowl, Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith, two of their better draft successes in the last few years. And then the offensive tackle situation in Kansas City seems like a rotating door every other year. It's Justin Reed now, not Tyron Matthew. It's Nick Bolton now, Trent McDuffie. It feels like these names have been there forever because you see the Chiefs on national TV every week and they win 11, 12, 13 games every year. But it's wild how different this thing truly is. And I can't wait to see who puts their stamp on it this time around. If you flip all the way back, it it's kind of surreal, honestly. I'm, look, I mean, we did... We had a pandemic in between the last time we played this game, but it was Tyree Kill, Chip Wasp to pick up that huge game. Chiefs down 10 with just seven minutes to play. Flipped everything on its head. Obviously, Tyreek not there. It was Jimmy Garoppolo overthrowing a deep ball that could have given the 49ers the lead in the fourth quarter. Richard Sherman played in this game last time they did it. It's... It's mind-boggling how much has really changed, and there's so much new. There are so many new names that can make their mark in this game. Could this be a legendary Super Bowl moment for Christian McCaffrey? Will it be Rasheed Rice stepping up and being a Super Bowl hero? I don't know, and that's what makes it interesting is it's easy to get fatigued by the logos and by the stars. But the truth of the matter is these two teams are so different and they have come up with so many new ways to win. Somebody that wasn't even in the NFL in 2019 is going to make a defining play in this Super Bowl. So move past the logos 
and look at the actual teams, and it becomes so much more interesting to see them going at it again four years later. All right, that's the first storyline. As promised, I'm going to have some help from our friends on the ground. Ben Arthur is in Vegas covering the game for us this week. I had a chance to chat with him about our second storyline. All right, for our second biggest storyline of Super Bowl 58, of course, we got to focus on the quarterback specifically when you have a generational quarterback playing in a Super Bowl, Patrick Mahomes is going to command a certain amount of attention. And I honestly, I see this as a no lose scenario for Patrick Mahomes. I mean, obviously he wants to win the game. He's a competitive guy, but this chiefs team as recently as December didn't look like it was supposed to be here. So if the chiefs lose this game for me personally, it doesn't change my opinion of him. Whereas if they win, now he's really entering rarefied air among all-time great quarterbacks. I mean, if he wins this Super Bowl, then only three quarterbacks will have won more than him. And he's just 28 years old. He'd be tied with Troy Aikman with three, Terry Bradshaw, Joe Montana, and obviously Tom Brady would have more. But to- but again, Patrick Mahomes is not even... He's. I mean, he's still got another year before he turns 30. So I think... You cement an all-time great legacy with a win here, but I really don't think a loss hurts him all that much either. What do you think, Ben? I don't think it hurts him either, Dave. And I think for me, like, we've seen a different aspect of Patrick Mahomes' greatness this season. I think that's what I think about the most because it has been an extremely frustrating, frustrating season for him. There have been all those drops leading the league like that wide receiver group leading the NFL in in drops more than any other wide receiver group since the 2012 Jacksonville Jaguars. There have been the penalties. There have been kind of all these mishaps. There have been those sideline outbursts, right? Like we've kind of known for his previous several years to be always calm and in control. And there were times where the emotions got uh, to him because of the frustration and, and whatnot, but being able to kind of com- com- compartmentalize all that w- when it has mattered most, turning it on after Christmas, uh, really putting aside what was the worst statistical year of his career in terms of being a starter, and within that still reminding us that he is Patrick Mahomes, that he's still the best football player on earth, Uh I think that says so much more about Mahomes. Like it it just kind of adds a different dimension to it. And uh, I I think maybe this is more about maybe an overarching theme about the Chiefs this year too, which are obviously different, but that they just have an edge that they haven't had to have in previous years because everyone just kind of expected them to be uh, competing for the Super Bowl and having this dynamic offense and all this pizzazz and whatnot. But it's been more of a slog this year. It's been more of a grind. And I think Patrick Mahomes, starting with Patrick Mahomes, they've had to embody more of a chip on their shoulder. And I think that's only fueled them. Like, if you remember what Deion Dawkins said uh, before they played the Bills in the AFC Divisional round, uh, and, and he basically, I don't remember the extent of, like, his remarks with the media, but at the end, he, he, he was basically wishing, like, Mahomes and the Chiefs, like, quote, good luck. And then... Obviously, the Chiefs beat them in Buffalo. And then his Instagram post after the game is like, you know, quote, good luck, end quote. You know, like 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 this this Mahomes, I feel like, is more edgy, or at least it's come out of him uh, because of the circumstances of this year. And I think to kind of tie it all back, like I think it just shows a different aspect to his greatness. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. And, I mean, you saw it last weekend too, like – Look, I'm I'm not trying to take sides in the Justin Tucker kerfluffle. I really don't care. But for the greatest quarterback of all time to like be dusting it up with the kicker of the other team, like yeah, Pat Pat Mahomes has a chip on his shoulder and I do think I'm sure he's always been a competitive guy. But the first few years of his career, it almost felt like he was happy go lucky. Like that yeah. meme of like he was like what? Like this is supposed to be hard? Like he just showed up and had these great teams from the get. And now I think Patrick Mahomes has a much deeper appreciation for how hard this stuff really is going through this season. I mean, I made the joke. He's a few, I think 
a few dropped passes. Like if, if Kadarius, Tony and MVS hold on to a few extra balls, it's not a stretch to see Patrick Mahomes winning back-to-back -back MVPs and having the chiefs in back-to-back -back Super Bowls. And that's the, the margin of error. And, and as competitive as he is, I bet he's a little bit pissed off about some of the opportunities that were missed this season. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and I know he's kind of talked about that too, but, uh, but yeah, it, it just, I, I think it just kind of goes back to being able to bring that all in, com compartmentalize all that, focus on the task at hand and uh, bring out that edge uh, to him uh, to, to, to kind of lead the chiefs in this way has been like r really cool to see. And, and, you know, kind of showing that edge that we've seen like the greatest of all time show, whether it's Tom Brady in his in his own sport or like a Michael Jordan. And and obviously their personalities are totally different. But I think even in like the last dance documentary, you, you saw like how all those little things would piss off Michael Jordan in, in just an insane way, whether whether it's something someone said and just dropping 50 on them. And now we're starting to see that. Like you can't, you you can't piss off Patrick Mahomes, or you're gonna pay in, in a big way. And, and I, I think that's that's really like like that's maybe the most awesome thing that that's maybe come out of this. Like as a an observer of sports, like just seeing that come out of him. And I think a similar thing to Michael Jordan is like if he can't, if something doesn't happen organically to piss him off, he's gonna make something up to get exactly. where he needs to go. Which hey. It's better entertainment value for me, so I'm all about it. So I, I I think we agree. Like I mean, this would just be this would be a crowning achievement. I mean, dragging this team can't say dragging. The defense has obviously been incredible, but getting this team to a championship after some of the downs they've been through, I mean, I I think it it cements him on the Mount Rushmore of NFL quarterbacks, in my opinion. But even even if you lose, I mean, hey, Tom Brady lost three of these things too. It's I you know I don't know that I'm holding Patrick Mahomes to some standard where he has to win this game every time he gets there, particularly against a, a team as loaded as San Francisco. One more legacy bit I want to get to as well. I, I mean, there's obviously there's several all time great components of this Chiefs team. There's there's rumors swirling. Maybe with a win, Andy Reid retires from coaching. Maybe Travis Kelsey calls this his last game. I don't think I buy the conspiracy talk that Travis Kelsey is going to propose to Taylor Swift when the game is over. Uh, but it it's not hard to imagine Kelsey walking away on top if the Chiefs do win this game. I mean, it's easy to forget. He was in Kansas City for four or five years before Patrick Mahomes ever became the starter. So I think I buy it more in regard to Travis Kelsey than Andy Reid. But what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. I just don't buy that. Obviously, there, I don't have sourcing to this. This is like my my gut talking. And I just don't see Kelsey calling it quits even like like after a win. Like I think he just has too much left in the tank uh to do that i think even despite everything that kind of happened this season i i think he was still the top tight end in the nfl even if that gap has sh uh shrunk si significantly whether that's a george kittle or a sam laporta who's going to be like the t the tight end of the future for the nfl but even though his dominance maybe wasn't where it has just in terms of his gap with the other guys, I think he is still number one. And then I think the way he's turned it on in a really special way in the playoffs, reminding everyone why he's kind of a first ballot hall of famer, like to, to be able to play the way he has the last several weeks and just for him to like go out, I, I don't know, just, just with him, just seeing like the kind of competitor he is, the edge that he has, like we were talking about the edge that Mahomes has, but Travis Kelsey has that edge too. Like he was, Oh, for sure. That thing with, yeah. He was in that thing with Justin Tucker too. Like even going out on his podcast and talking about how like, you know, poking the bear and, and all that. And yeah, I, I think just Travis Kelsey is an edgy guy, mo maybe more edgy than, than Mahomes. And I just see him like wanting to keep running it back. You know, like I, I just don't, I don't see a scenario where 
he he puts a bow like on his career, even even with a win. It's really hard for me to believe that. Even at his age, I think he's what thirty four right now. Yeah, but I don't believe it. Yeah, you never. I mean, you never know for sure, right? You never yeah. know when you're gonna get back to this point. But if I'm Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid, I mean, this is this is the most uneven. I hate to say worst, but th this is one of the worst teams of the Patrick Mahomes era, in my opinion, in terms of totality. And so to to be on the cusp of another championship, I mean, you think about legacy stuff like Travis Kelsey, you add another good receiver to this Chiefs offense and you're right back where you were. Teams are focusing less on you and more on that. I think you could get easily several more years of production and maybe multiple championships out of this. Same thing for Andy Reid. If Andy Reid wins this game, then he is one of, what, five coaches with three Super Bowl titles? And if he, I mean, again, Patrick Mahomes is 28. Andy Reid could ride this thing to an even greater spot in the Pantheon than he already has. So I just, I think all of this just looks too good in Kansas City for me to completely believe anybody's going to hop off the train right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree, Dave. And with this defense being so elite, they, they are so young too. I, I think there's something like the sixth youngest defense in the NFL and the fact that they're this good, like you could keep running it back with this, with that defense and then just adding more reinforcements on offense and thinking about the strides that Rasheed Rice can take, you know, like really yep. becoming that dominant number one to take pressure off of Mahomes and Kelsey, adding another receiver, adding another running back, adding some depth behind Kelsey. Like you could just, there's a clear path, for this thing to keep going right and, and just seeing what Andy Reid and Mahomes and Kelsey have accomplished like I could see a scenario where they're where they all come together and and they're like let's keep doing it let's keep seeing what happens I mean six six straight uh AFC uh title uh AFC championship game appearances the, their fourth Super Bowl appearance in five years like and and it does and it's not like the breaks are coming off. I think sometimes with these teams, when they get to the mountaintop, it's easy to see how it's going to break apart, right? Because the players are too old or the depth isn't quite there. But with the Chiefs, I don't really see that. Like Mahomes, I mean, Kelsey may be a little older, but he still has a lot left in the tank. Their offense has a lot of room to grow and their defense despite being elite is still very, very young. So like why, like I could see them, see them keep like, let's run it back. Let's run it back. So. Yeah. And we're, we're talking about this, you know, we're kind of hit, like we're suggesting that the chiefs might win this game, which I mean, they, they could, but imagine the fire in Kansas city. If they lose this game, like I, I definitely, I have a hard time imagining anybody's going to step away having come that close, but we'll see how it goes. I, yeah, like I said, I think, all of these legacies are secure in Kansas city, but a lot they can do to add to them with a win against San Francisco. Ben, thanks for the time, man. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate you. And over on the other side, our guy, Ralph Vacchiano is also in Las Vegas this week to cover super bowl 58. And I had a chance to chat with him about our third storyline. All right, Ralph, our third storyline previewing super bowl 58. It appeals to my dorky, sensibilities in the biggest way like this is the stuff that i really get excited about is how do you construct a super bowl roster where are you allocating the money and the chiefs and the 49ers it's it's the most interesting juxtaposition of the way that you build a team because there's getting very basic with it there's two schools of thought and it's you build it around an expensive, badass quarterback that can elevate everything around him and you make sacrifices because of it, or you don't pay the quarterback anything and that enables you to have a badass at every position on the field. And that's what you get with the Chiefs and the 49ers. And, and I can't wait to see what matters more. Is it truly the quarterback or is it having the talent everywhere else? It is really, really interesting and you know, if you're the from the 49ers perspective, there's a little bit of luck getting into the position that they're in. They didn't draft Brock Purdy as Mr. Irrelevant, thinking he's the quarterback we're going to build around. Every team wants that rookie quarterback on that rookie contract with low cap numbers and so they can build a team around them. But they're always thinking first round money still 
not seventh round money. This is just an extreme version of that dream. So they luck into that type of quarterback. They haven't broken the bank for him yet. And it does open up a lot of what they can spend. They can spend on luxuries that most teams can't afford. Not only adding, you know, all pro type players in, in, in the lines and in other positions, but think about running back and all they're paying Christian McCaffrey, which bucks the trend that every other team now is living by. Do not pay running backs money. And, and there's a million reasons why they may not be worth it. But for the 49ers, who cares? They've got the extra cap room for it. So Christian McCaffrey's a weapon they think they need. Go get him. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing that, again, teams teams dream of having that. But they don't even think that having a seventh rounder um, and his type of cap room is a possibility. That's just something that once you get it, you, know, you may as well take advantage of it, which is what they've done. I think everybody knows Patrick Mahomes, the highest cap hit in the NFL. He signed a half a billion dollar contract that seem, is, is amazingly a steal for the Kansas City Chiefs at this point. But the wonderful stat from our producers, Brock Purdy, 67th in the NFL among quarterbacks in terms of cap hit, he's costing them a million dollars against the salary cap. So if I'm just doing basic math, that means most of the backups in the NFL are costing their teams more than Brock Purdy is. And yeah, to your point, that's why a trade for Christian McCaffrey doesn't hurt your bottom line. That's why Nick Bosa, Debo Samuel, Trent Williams, Fred Warner, am I missing anybody, are all playing on these large, large contracts. It's... It's what every team dreams about. It, it honestly, it reminds me a little bit of the Seahawks finding Russell Wilson, except he was yeah. a third round pick. It right. just, it's, it's, it's staggering. Right. And if you want to blow your mind more, think of if Brock Purdy suddenly next year gets the going rate for quarterbacks, which is around $40 million. Certainly, whether you think he's worth that or not, takes his team to a Super Bowl, takes his team to the NFC Championship the year before. He's a $40 million quarterback in this current economic situation so raise his cap number by 40 million dollars and then go through the 49ers roster and see who you'll have to take away it'll probably be a pro bowl roster that you have to take away to fit him in um that's how much getting a a, a low price guy like brock purdy has done for their roster construction okay and then there, there's the obvious flip side as well i mean we know we know the chiefs are capable of winning this game because they did it last year I mean, obviously, the teams aren't completely the same, but a very similar Chiefs roster beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl last year. So even with Patrick Mahomes counting for so much of their salary cap, they are still able to build championship caliber teams. What's going to be interesting for me, and I know, I mean, the Niners are favored. I'm not trying to decide this game a week ahead of time, but they've been here with Jimmy Garoppolo. They knew that he wasn't good enough. That's why they went out and got Trey Lance. It didn't work out. They fall ass backward into Brock Purdy. But what happens if, if this isn't enough? What happens if Patrick Mahomes clearly proves to be the difference in this game? How demoralizing must that be for a team like San Francisco, basically faced with the reality of, yep, the quarterback really does matter that much, even if you can afford to assemble this Avengers-like roster. Yep. They'll have a soul-searching in the offseason. And look, Brock Purdy's payday is coming. Um, you know, it, it, I'm sure his agent after this is going to want to renegotiate his deal. And um, if not, uh, you know, a year later, he's certainly going to be looking at a big raise. They're going to have to make a decision if they go into this game and Mahomes just – obliterates them and Purdy throws a couple of interceptions. Can we win a championship with him or not? Do we have to somehow dig back into the draft or dip into free agency or just find another avenue? You know, it's harder for them because they're obviously picking late in the draft, but you know, there's always trades. There's, there's other possibilities. There's certainly going to be some quarterbacks available this off season, but it's not in this economic climate where quarterbacks make so much it's not a slam dunk that a quarterback who brings his team to a Super Bowl and falls short is automatically going to be the long-term guy. They have to make that decision um, and say, and just answer the question, can we win this championship with him? If not, doesn't matter what he's done. They're not going to pay him. And they might have to just start looking for the next Patrick Mahomes or, you know, Josh Allen or whatever quarterback you, Dak Prescott, Jalen Hurts, that type of franchise quarterback that obviously is so hard to find. 
That's so crazy to think about. And, and I've always been an advocate of like, when you identify the quarterback, just pay him because it's only going to get more expensive. You get out ahead of it. You get him in on a deal that's cheaper against the market because the market's always rising. But it is interesting to think so much, so much else is in place here. And if Brock Purdy stumbles, at the very least, do you let him play out this rookie deal because it's so advantageous? It allows you to keep that number low. And I don't know what else the Niners can do to this roster, but maybe it at least gives you a chance to build it up one more time before you have to make that decision. Yeah, I mean, they think they might have to do that. And obviously, Purdy and his agent are not going to want him to do that, but it's a fiscally responsible decision for the 49ers. Um, especially if they're not sure, you know, I mean, don't underestimate the fact that Kyle Shanahan may look at this and think we're here because of my offensive genius. We're here because um, I've gotten Purdy to a place where he can win with the guys around him. But imagine if I had a more talented quarterback, uh, we know, we don't know what he really feels deep down about Brock Purdy, obviously as recently as the summer that was in question. So, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of tough decisions and, um, I'm sure from their perspective, they're going to want to find a way if, if he doesn't win the Super Bowl to you know keep that rookie contract going. Don't pay him just yet. Let's see if we can get away with doing that and take some more time to make this evaluation because it is the biggest, most important decision for any franchise when they decide to pay that quarter. You pay the wrong guy, you're stuck for a few years and you're in salary cap hell for a few years. It's not a mistake that's easy to get away from. It's not like signing the wrong linebacker or defensive end you know you're stuck with that quarterback and uh, they've got to be really sure if they're if they've got a championship window that he's the right guy to help them break through it there are some there's there's intrigue here for the Chiefs as well I mean Mahomes is again when you have Mahomes I don't know if they can afford to pay Chris Jones what he's going to want when this season is over I think they'll probably be in the market for a left tackle for the what feels like the fourth year in a row but man, those issues are a hell of a lot easier to deal with when you know that even with this massive cap hit, your quarterback can get you to back-to-back Super Bowls. Right. I mean, you know, you you can deal with flaws. Like, for example, their atrocious receiving core. I mean, how many times this season we watch games where we're like, man, if you had only somebody to throw to that could hold on to the ball, they could be a devastating team. But they don't, and they're still in the Super Bowl. Um, so, you know, they can pick their spots and say, okay, well, what do we need? Um, you know, their offensive line wasn't great necessarily a year ago, and that was okay. They've, then they they went and tried to fix that. Um, you know, they could decide they're, they're running, they're dealing with, you know, younger underpaid running backs instead of going out and getting a Christian McCaffrey. So, you know, they can try to plug holes and, you know, get budget players because Patrick Mahomes, his appearance, his, his, his stature, his ability, it just changes everything so they can get away with deficiencies in other areas. There's a million ways to build a football team, a championship football team, but this is just, it's the most interesting case study. It is the ultimate example of best QB, make it work everywhere else, or have everything else, cheap quarterback. I I can't wait to see. I don't think one game is a referendum on anything, but it's going to show a lot about what really is more important having that guy or having everything else i can't wait to see it ralph thanks for the time man anytime so much to say about the game itself about the teams the rosters the matchups but for the next storyline i was joined by our friend carmen vitale to talk about the very interesting backdrop of this game which i think is a little more unique than a lot of super bowls in the recent past all right carmen see if you follow my logic here This feels like the first Super Bowl in a decade where the location of the game is is relevant in a way beyond like having fun. And I'm I'm talking about okay, so Super Bowl 48 was played outdoors in New York, Seahawks, Broncos, and there much was made about the the elements and what that might mean to the game, which ironically they missed a blizzard by like a day. But this, and and look, Allegiant Stadium, it's indoors. I'm not talking about that, but Las Vegas being the site of a championship event feels really meaningful to me when you consider the way that gambling has, I mean, it's always been there, but the way that the NFL has embraced it over the last few years, this feels like 
the crowning achievement of like, should we move a team there? Should the Raiders relocate to Las Vegas? It was, it all feels like this was in mind of like, we can get a Super Bowl right here on the strip. If you've ever been to Las Vegas, it is so perfectly set up for something like this. You have so many hotels, you have so many event spaces, you have an airport that's right near the strip. You have, it's it's close to a place like at Los Angeles where we are now, it's close to Phoenix. It's there, it is so well equipped to handle this influx of visitor, the influx of visitors that come with the Super Bowl because this is what Vegas does. And they have the, the amount of sports books in Vegas, which have always been there to your, to your point, have exploded now where you have entire just hotels that are taken over by sports books. And, and I mean, that's, that's happening in every city in America at this point, every major city that gambling is legal, but it, it does feel like with the NFL embracing gambling, it was like the last frontier. Mm hmm Yes. And it's so fitting too that Las Vegas is 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 the West, the wild, wild West. And the the like they have now conquered the NFL, which is the biggest sport too in North America. I just I can't really put into words how fitting this all is and how insane this is all going to be. It's and look, I'm not saying the Super Bowl is gonna be in Vegas every year. But but it really feels like I think if the NFL had their way, no, they like this, I think this is this is going to be the start. I think of Vegas having a Super Bowl at least every few years. You know, like Miami, Miami, and New Orleans have traditionally been cities like that, where it's like the weather's going to be good. There's a lot of stuff to do right near the stadium. There's a lot of fun stuff going on, and it it just fits the chaos that yep. Super Bowl week has become so well. And you know Vegas wants it. Look at also it's it's so funny. Gambling is always going to be the center of it, but the way Vegas is trying to rebrand itself, I would they had no, not trying. They have successfully right. rebranded themselves as this championship event hosting place. I mean, they had an F1 race there recently. Mm -hmm. They've got the Super they've Bowl had, now. They've had multiple All-Star games there for like for NHL uh, the year I was there for the Pro Bowl, the NHL All-Star Game was also going on, which to be able to host both of those events simultaneously, insane. But Vegas is so well-equipped for all of that. And I think that as far as streamlining all of the extracurriculars that go on leading up to the Super Bowl and even like around the game itself, there is no city better for, better suited for, handling all of that very seamlessly than Las Vegas, which is, which is, a, it's a favorite, it's his favorite city of mine. Let me tell oh, you, I someone, know. someone I who know went to that. Arizona state, mm -hmm. I think my senior year, I was there once, once a month, but, oh, um, you said that into a microphone. Good I really you. did, but it's the truth. And I don't shy away from it. It's a, it's a really fun place. It is adult Disney world. I just, I all due respect to the Raiders. I know they're, I mean, they're looking to be as profitable as possible, but I believe that the NFL was was keen on the idea of getting the Raiders to Vegas for this. To show that, hey, we can do football. Well, to for the NFL to be like, how can we have, how do we have a reason to be in Las Vegas, basically? And now they do. And, and now there's no going back, which there is, there's an interesting element of this too. Like, have you read the stories that the Chiefs and the Niners are going to be staying like 30 miles outside so, of, okay. of Las Vegas. They tried to do this. And granted, when it's p teams that are playing in the Super Bowl and all of the prep and the seriousness behind all of that, that's different. They tried to do this with the Pro Bowl the year I was there a, few, a couple of years ago. The way that all of those players, they were given hotel rooms in, I think, Henderson, close to the ballpark that they were using practice for, the baseball ball, ballpark. Uh the way that they got there and were like, absolutely not, and rebooked themselves hotels on the strip. Okay, but see, that's not going to happen here. No, it's not because, because of the seriousness. Of that, that's the thing. That's what I'm interested to see how this goes because we have seen, like the NFL has cracked down on gambling violations. Like Jamison Williams comes to mind. A lot of Lions players. He got, you know, several Lions players got hit in the off season for placing bets at their facility, right? Right. Now think about not whole, NFL bets too. Not even NFL bets, right. but now imagine. I mean, now imagine the 
the intrigue in this game, the obvious betting value of this game, you can't have a chief or 49er player anywhere near anywhere the strip, near the strip like, right. for the optics of it. And then I even read NFL players in general are not supposed to like be in sports books. Right. You and I both know, like right. for we both worked for NFL franchises at a time. Even Joe Schmo working for a oh, team yeah. is not Me supposed as a team to be in a sports could book. not be in a, in a sports book. That was something that was communicated to us prior to going to Pro, Pro Bowl. And the guys that were there from the team I was with, they were very cognizant of that and they didn't. But what was funny is that they weren't allowed in the sports books, but then we were at the craps tables. <laughs> like those th that's fine, but it's the sports books that they were they were told to keep out of. I just think Everybody in the NFL universe is going to be there. And and the NFL has has just embraced gambling in the biggest way, and it's very profitable, and I understand why. But there are optical concerns here when you're talking about the number of officials that are going to be – officials, players, coaches, whoever, they are going to be in the gambling capital of the world the going week of the biggest game. Going back to what game. you just said, though, about bringing the Raiders to Vegas – this was also a test run of like, can an NFL team function here? Can we get past the stigma of being a gambling capital and also housing an NFL team? Can the players stay out of trouble? Can the players, and to their credit, I, I, I can't remember a Raiders player getting in trouble for gambling, can you? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, so I think that was also kind of the, the test run of bringing that team to Vegas saying, look, this can work. We can bring NFL players around this, and and this can happen. I just have to imagine the league is going to have a lot of extra eyes around oh, for sure. the city during the lead up to this game. I, I I don't I don't think anything nefarious is going to happen, but it's interesting <laughs> to think about. I believe the hotels that the teams are staying at too are ones that do not have casinos in them yeah. either. They're going to have the most boring week of their lives. Right it was already going to be that way. Yeah, they have media yeah. all the time. The the cadence of Super Bowl week, it's a wonder that any of these teams look good in the Super Bowl because the like the the constant media, I mean you're doing media every single day. You're the 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 hullabaloo that's happening around these teams. I mean, even when you're removed because even in Phoenix last year, you and I were both there. The team hotels were very far from yep. the stadium. They were very far from downtown Phoenix. I mean, you, they keep those guys out there on an island, but at the same time, that just means that all of the media has to go to those hotels. Uh, everybody comes to them, but it's still a very gr grueling schedule. And they don't have time. They wouldn't have had time anyway to really hit the casinos at all. It's just, it's now become about all the other NFL players that are there I doing say. Radio Row and, and you know, pimping out whatever they need to pimp out that that week they are allowed to stay on the strip. They are going to be staying on the strip, but those aren't team facilities. They are not, it's not team uh, premises. So I'm, I'm still interested to see how it goes. I, I think there, there, there might be an NFL like official at every single sports book, like the entrance, just literally looking out for these guys. That's what I'm saying. I, I think, like I said, this is for not, I mean, the game is, the game's great and it's on its own, but this is the most interesting Super Bowl city in, I think, in, in at least a decade. Yeah. Just, there, there's just a, there's so much of added has, wrinkles to it. So much of it has nothing to do with football, though, and that's the part that everybody wanted to bring it to Vegas for. Is Because, again, like I'm saying, it is such a well-equipped city to handle all of the people that will travel for a Super Bowl and all of the event spaces and all of the media opportunities and all of the fun bright lights and all that other stuff. Like, for everything outside of football, Vegas is perfect. Vegas, baby. Can't wait to see how it goes. You're going to have to tell me all about it later. Carm, thanks for the time. <laughs> thanks. Our last storyline in this overview might elicit some eye rolls, but I would advise you to get over it because we are several months into Taylor Swift joining the NFL sphere. And I got to tell you, for the biggest game of the year, you're not going to ignore the presence of the biggest pop star on planet Earth. And Thanks to diligent reporting from everyone, I have it on good authority, she'll be back from a show in Tokyo in time for this game. So I'm just going to advise you to get ready to see her. And, and if you haven't heard already, like, suck it up. Don't, don't complain. They've, they've done the studies that she's, she's on air for like an average of 30 seconds per three and a half hour broadcast. You're going to be okay. It's not hurting the game. If anything, I am delighted 
at the element of ridiculousness that the Swifties are going to bring to the Super Bowl. Like, if you're not familiar with Taylor Swift, just know that her fans have an ingenuity all their own in terms of turning over stones and seeing things that other people didn't see. Maybe you've already heard the stuff like it's Super Bowl 58 and what's five plus eight? That would be 13, which is Taylor Swift's favorite number. When is the game played? February 11th, which two 11, what's two plus 11? 13. Yeah, this is the type of stuff that the Swifties do. Like, you know, you've heard the controversy that the Super Bowl logo reflects the teams. Please just know the Swifties are going to see something in the signage, in the game. They do it with her album releases. It's going to be fun. It's going to be ridiculous. I can't wait to see what social media does with Taylor Swift's presence in this game. And if the Kansas City Chiefs happen to win, no, I, I, like I said earlier, am I expecting a, a proposal on the field after the game? Absolutely not. But I do think it's going to draw a hell of a lot of eyeballs. And pardon the pun, I think this will add to the overall folklore of this Super Bowl and of the game itself. The NFL has been trying to get Taylor Swift involved in a Super Bowl for years. The open secret is that they've wanted her to be the halftime show several times, and Taylor Swift might be one of three people on the planet that's too big for the Super Bowl's platform. Well, she wound up here anyway, and it's going to be a bonanza. I'm looking at it right now. 113 million people watched Super Bowl 57 on Fox last year, Chiefs first Eagles. I'm here to tell you right now, a large percentage of people that might not tune in or at least might not pay attention to the game are going to be doing so for Taylor Swift. You don't have to agree with it. You can think it's stupid if you want to. It's not going to change anything. And I, for one, think it's going to up the entertainment factor. It's going to be a memorable part of the Super Bowl, and she's not even performing. Leave it to Taylor Swift to find a way to make her mark. I'm just jealous. You're not supposed to be able to just hop into football like this and be a part of a Super Bowl. Think of all the fan bases that have been waiting for years, for decades, for an opportunity at this stage, and Taylor Swift just so happened to meet Travis Kelsey six months before he made a run to the big game. It's nice to be Taylor. It's going to be fun to see how it all happens. Like I said, you don't have to like it. It's an undeniable part of this Super Bowl 58 storyline, and I'm excited to see it play out. All right, that does it for today's show. The big overview is done. We will be back with so much more Super Bowl specific content. Like I said, please go vote in our polls on Twitter. Help us decide our postseason awards. We will have you covered all the way through the week. We're going to have reactions from media night, we'll see what these guys have to say about their first days in Vegas. Lot to look forward to. We will be here for all of it. So like I said, you know the drill. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you get your content, wherever you download your podcasts, we will be there for you all the way up through the game. Cannot wait for this game. Cannot wait for this week. We will talk to you all real soon.